Our final storyteller is a retiree living in Northern Virginia who says that he is living in a body that he would not trade for anything in the world. Please say hello to John Etherton. I live in a world that's inconvenient. I'm trying always to outrun or sidestep walls that are physical or social all the time. I face spaces that are inaccessible or unreachable, and when I'm out, I'm always on my guard for people who can't see past my dwarfism and the antiquated stereotypes that still too often are associated with it. It's my work to do, to meet the world halfway and to overcome my resistance to seeking and accepting the help I need from other people. Maybe that's all of our work to do. That's better. <laughs> I've dreamed of making music, especially violin music, for as long as I can remember. So last year, in February, at age 68, I decided to try to learn how to play the violin. I was hearing my kids start to use the word spry. <laughs> so I figured, you know what? Let's give it a go. If I hit a wall, at least I don't have to think about that. The folks down at the music store didn't miss a beat when I showed up, with what was surely the most novel request of their day. They started out trying to fit me with a violin that would fit the extended arm. The problem is that I have a very rare form of dwarfism called acromesomelic dysplasia, and it has given me these very short, fat fingers. So I need a fingerboard that's very wide, much wider than you're going to get with one of these smaller violins. So we huddled in the store, and as I was listening to the back and forth, I brought up uh, Galen Lee, who is a world-class musician who happens to have dwarfism, and who plays the violin basically standing it upright. So we decided <coughs> that I would start with a half-size violin and a quarter-size bow, and I would play, sort of prop it up on my thigh. So now I needed to find a teacher. Finding a good violin teacher in the middle of the school year <laughs> for a older, absolute, total beginner adult with dwarfism who's going to play the violin backwards and upside down <laughs> actually turned out to be a lot easier than I thought. <laughs> it was all due to our uh, wonderful, amazing uh, church minister of music, Abby, and her local community of local musicians. It only took me two phone calls, and an hour later, Charles, who's a young musician, a young violinist with one of the military string orchestras, agreed to come and give me a lesson. And he did so after I explained to him on the phone what my situation was. Now, I was not so much interested in learning a lot at that first lesson. My prime directive was getting Charles to come back and give me another lesson, <laughs> after he had actually scoped it out, that he would see enough promise to, to, to continue with this. And he did come back. He's still coming back. And after struggling for a couple weeks uh, with these sort of standard proper violin techniques like bow holds and hand positions on the neck, uh, with my very short hands and fingers, Charles announced that the technique, the right technique for me would be whatever technique worked. Even so, he never stopped letting up on me. He is pushing me really hard. And he reminds me over and over again that different bone length not, notwithstanding, my hand anatomy and my finger anatomy and my mechanics are the same as any other players. What's been my biggest challenge? Keeping the violin from moving around so much. I don't have the length to be able to prop it between my knees or put it under my chin. And grabbing the neck firmly with my left hand and playing at the same time with my very short thumb is impossible. So, random things in the universe, wisdom of members of my family really gave me a lot of the answers. Now I try whenever possible just to let the world be my room of requirement, like in the Harry Potter books. <laughs> but in order for that to work, you really need to know exactly what you need so that you can recognize it when you see it. One night I was doing laundry 
And there it was. Someone had taken a piece of old uh, non-skid fabric that you put underneath the rug and cut a piece off and just they just threw it into the basket. I had seen it maybe a hundred times, never noticed it until right then. I reached down, I pulled it up, I folded it, put it on my thigh, put the violin on top of it, and it actually stopped the wobbling for a bit. But as time went on, I needed something a lot stronger. One day, I was with my family at my brother's workshop, and I was showing him my violin and explaining what was going on with that. And my sister-in-law looked at me and she said, you know what you need? You need something to wrap around the bottom of it like a towel. My older brother immediately got up, went into his back room, came out 30 seconds later with a pocket that he made out of leftover packing foam and gaff tape, handed it to me and said, try this. And it worked. Charles was really impressed. <laughs> Pushing the violin out in front of my knee gave me a wonderful unexpected bonus. I was able to transition from my half-size violin to this full-size, much richer sounding violin that a member of a dear friend in our church community has, has let me borrow. So, I am doing things now that were inconceivable, inconceivable to me when I first started getting into it. In December, uh, for, uh, for the first time, as a 10-month-old student, I played at church. Two weeks ago, I performed before hundreds of people in Baltimore at the Little People of America National Conference Talent Show. But mostly, I am just finding the joy in learning to finally be able to make my own musical noise, and, and in believing I can continue on with this. So, I'm still a very much beginner student who has made a very, very late start. But with my amazing community, family and friends, and a few sort of clever magical tricks, I'm managing for now to stay one step ahead of the wall. <laughs>